Keep going, Jonathan. We'll do the intro after. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was saying is, is this idea of we're all try a lot of people are trying to attach to their higher self or connect to it. Um, and I think that's like a general, uh, not a general, it's a common desire is to think, to get to this big spiritual realm. Um, and this is where we come from. <clears throat> Maybe a difference from the traditional alchemical view is not, and then the spiritual view, right? Spirit is all about connecting to that higher self. Mm. Whereas the alchemical view is about going deep inside and feeling those transformations inside in the deepest part of yourself and working with that, mm -hmm. which is what creates a presence here in this earth, this moment, this place, as opposed to that ever ending expansion and uh, beauty. Mm. You know, this in, Bu in Buddhism, it's one of the key points is, is once you have gotten to nirvana, the job is then to come back and to work here and now well holding on or well still being in that realm. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because um, a long time ago, I used to look at, I was looking at hermetics, you know, this mm -hmm. uh, and um, a lot of the guys that were in that sort of field of study um, ended up like doing years and years of studying Franz Baden's work and then turning around and saying, actually, Buddhism is, is, is the highest hermetic discipline because of that very reason. Um, and I'm not saying like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not casting that Buddhism is the best thing ever or whatever. It's not, I don't have, it's, a view on that, it's just, it's, it's one of the paths that we can use to understand. Yeah. It, it's like almost the highest, it's like the epitome of what hermeticism is. It's like, as you say, going really in, mm -hmm. going up there and then coming back and working, but keeping hold of what you've learned. So, you, you know, in other words, you're not wiping it all clean and coming back with zero. Exactly. Um, so that's super interesting. Um, I, there is a tradition I trained with where they believe very much the same as like, obviously the same as the humans, that there is evolution in the planet. And with that evolution, there's an energetic evolution and that there are frequencies on the planet that are constantly downloaded and you can tap into those frequencies every few hundred years and, and work with those frequencies rather than relying on, so like this morning we did an hour of Qigong, Neigong, uh, poor breathing work, Dan Tian assimilation, and um and it's it's i like it because it's beautiful right because it it's it's like meditation and movement and breath and just being just being but having fun with just being um where there are others that um they they they, they how can i say they don't really want to do do the work they just want to have <laughs> um yeah, I don't, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it's... I think I do know what you're trying to say is, is often this is... There's two key words I find, and a lot of people do this work, is they look at transformation and transcendence. And I think most people are looking for transcendence. Hmm. Are there, They think they're looking for transcendence. And that leads to two, well, two other terms. Is One is what's called a spiritual bypass. In other words, you're connecting to the universe, what's greater, etc., without dealing with the emotional states of what's coming up. It's almost like That's if right. you connect to the universe, you don't have to deal with the emotions. Mm. Um, which also then leads to something else called spiritual spiritual materialism, where they're trying to accumulate as much spiritualism as they can, as it yes. being an object that can be accumulated. Yes, I actually had a client like that this week. Mm -hmm. And a um, su super intelligent person. And, and that's the whole aim. He was on that realm of, as look at me, I've got this, 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 and this. And it's like, wow. 
yeah, and I had a sense of one of the, a large amount of accumulation. But where's the wisdom? My question was like, where is the wisdom? Yeah. For that? And you know, it goes back to one of the um, Buddhist terms, which is shempa, which is often translated into grasping and clinging. And when you notice grasping and clinging, the idea in Shempa is to let go of grasping and clinging. The idea is, is that your hand should always be open. Mm -hmm. um, and often what a lot of people do is they, they accumulate all these spiritual practices, but then they're holding on to them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And in some ways, you know, there are some spiritual systems that do incorporate working with the emotion the emotions that come up buddhism is one of them parts of hinduism does it some of taoism does it um but a lot of what is sold today and what is in the mainstream is all about be parts of the universe and that's it without dealing with what emotions what's really coming up for you inside and working through it because the often one of the a great a great phrase i think it's michael brown who uses it almost always in his work is the way out is through mm -hmm. it's not jumping over it's not avoiding it's going through what's there mm. Mm. reminds me of an interview i had when i was in my 20s for a debt recovery job <laughs> and the interview was like you know um you have an obstacle in front of you and it's a wall um what do you do to you know navigate this obstacle this was like the question in the interview and i, I don't remember exactly because it's mm -hmm. you know 30 odd years ago but it it was this idea of I just said, well, you know, look at the side. I, I kind of went through the logic. How high is the wall? How wide is the wall? Can you can you go over it? Can you go around it? Can you dig under it? And and I think that was in the epitome of what we are as humans, you know, avoidance. And um, there is that that like the conversation we had earlier was. Um, being guided like what guides you and and um you know are there inherent patterns that cause deviations in that guidance um and for some people do they hit these brick walls literally hit them and not metaphorically speaking you know emotionally and mentally um and in some cases yeah maybe physical you know you hear these stories of people who they're supposed to get somewhere they're supposed to go to a, a funeral or a meeting or a a party and they end up, you know, breaking their leg, getting on the bus or something. And it's like, was that an accident? You know, uh, was it really an accident? Um, you know, people, people say, oh, well, you know, my wife, when she came off a horse quite badly, it was, it was there to slow her down. You know, <laughs> this kind of mm -hmm. strange language that we use to describe these uh, events. And then part of me thinks, well, there could be an element of truth to that, you know, mm -hmm. because what is the path that we're on? No, we well, think of path as like a 2D, you know, like the path, my garden path. We think of it as a flat surface. But I think when we talk, you know, people are talking about 3D, 4D, 5D. Mm -hmm. Is our path multidimensional? Well, I think there's that. And when we talk about the term path, often we go to Taoism because that's what Taoism means. It means the path, right? The Tao mm -hmm. is the path or the way. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is the term in Taoism that's used is not to follow the path, but to cultivate the path. And what does cultivation of a path differ from following a path? Following a path means that the path is there and you just have to walk along it. Cultivating means is that you're constantly creating the path as you're moving, mm -hmm. right? You're constantly engaged in the creation of the path itself. Mm -hmm. So we can still use this two or three dimensional version of there's a path, but 
every step is creating the path as you move forward. Yeah. yeah. Which means it might mean moving this tree, stepping on this branch. But if the idea is, is to follow the flow of the universe as you create that path. Mm. Um, and often, you know, there's a shamanic saying that I've heard before. I don't remember where I heard it was the universe first, first takes a little stick and starts to tap you on the shoulder to get you to follow the right path. Mm. If you don't listen, it starts to hit harder. Then it starts to tap you. Then it starts to beat you. And it will get mm. all the way till it finally impales you until you actually listen to the path. Mm. So by not listening to the universe, one of the consequences of that can be death. If you don't listen, if you keep ignoring the universe. It's interesting, you know, what, like I always think, I try to think in terms of our modern world where we're at and the things that we're exposed to. And often there are lessons right in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, when I think of Taoism lately, I've been thinking, I don't know if you watch The Mandalorian. I haven't, no. Um, there, is a, there is a character in that. I think it's Caliph or Caliph or whatever. It begins with K. It's played by Nick Nolte. And um, this character has spent a lifetime in servitude, you know, and with the, with the promise of eventually having his freedom and eventually he gets his freedom. And he's what we call a moisture farmer. So he's trying to gather water, you know, on, on a desert planet. But what I love about him is he, he has this element of like harshness, gratitude, He's been in servitude. He's now has an element of freedom. But whenever something happens, whether it's good or bad, he'll stand there and go, this is the way. <laughs> so for, me, for me, it's like the epitome of Taoism, you know. It's like, you know, one of the spaceships blows up or maybe one of the creatures they managed to capture or whatever. And he's like, yeah, this is the way. And, and I think that's the epitome of Taoism is, yes, there's an element of self-cultivation either either as a Taoist priest right so yeah. doing more of that sort of work sort of uh, the esoteric work and uh, they do a lot of calligraphy and prayer work and stuff like that or you're more like the alche alchemist you know the alchemy yeah. Taoist so you're doing internal martial arts or internal nagel nadan practices with the idea of, of creating enough internal alchemy for the for the pathway to become apparent but sometimes the pathway is just <laughs> this, is the way. this is the Tao. This is where we're at. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, do, I don't favor any, any one thing. I'm just fascinated with it. You know, yeah. I'm fascinated with, I'm almost fascinated with, I need to have it. That's true. Um, one thing that you said that was interesting though, is this idea of freedom, right? So yeah, what does it yeah. mean to be free? Yeah. Or, or you can even take that to the general philosophical question, does free will exist? Mm. Mm. Um, so one of the things that I often say, and this is my internal, is free will does exist, but not in the way that we think it does. For me, your freedom of choice or freedom of will is how much you you are free to decide how much you resist the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's our freedom. Mm. Hmm. And once you let go of your desire to resist the universe, you are the idea of free will of yourself fades away. But ultimate freedom of being part of the universe comes into play. And it's almost like a paradoxical is the more you attach to free will that I have the choice in what I do, the less free you are. Mm. But yeah, you like paradoxes though. <laughs> well, life is a paradox. Yeah. It's like that image behind you, the Banksy one, you know, mm -hmm. at a distance, it looks like you should be throwing a petrol bomb. Yeah. 
It's actually very interesting, the story about this, is that it was, Banksy wrote it, uh, created this. There was a manifestation, so there was a demonstration in front of a parliament in one of the Eastern, country, Eastern European countries. But at the beginning, it wasn't a manifestation. It uh, wasn't a demonstration. It was, or it was a rally to support the president. And one person, instead of starting to yell, um, "Long live the president," they started to yell, "We deserve more from the president." And because everybody in the group who was there thought, "Well, if somebody's saying it, this must be what we're supposed to say," mm. so they all started saying, "We deserve more from the president." And that's what created the whole revolution to overthrow the regime. Hmm. So that's the idea of the demonstration, but by throwing flowers, it's actually more effective than the Molotov cocktail. It also reminds me of uh, the lead singer of the Smiths. Mm -hmm. And he used to come out on stage and throw flowers. Yeah. And it was like, you know, you're supposed to be this kind of band that's a little bit weary and a little bit sort of on the edge and uh how do i say not quite gothic but um you know new agey indie yeah and then you're expecting them to come out and like you know fuck the government and blah, blah, blah. and then he's out throwing flowers <laughs> and it's just that you know i mean morrissey you know He's he's um interesting character. But yeah, it's that that paradox. I remember going to see Alice Cooper here in Dublin, well in Dublin in Ireland, and um he was playing support act to a couple of other bands that myself and my wife wanted to see. And I thought, oh, here we go. But I tell you what, he blew everyone away. He was such the consummate professional, mm -hmm. he's uber intelligent. He knew exactly what the political, at the time it was 2008 or nine or something like that. And he knew the political ramifications that were going on in Ireland at the time. And uh, he came dressed up like a, an American president, you know, with the big tall hat, this kind of image of, you know. Mm -hmm. Uncle like, Sam. Yeah, Uncle Sam but they had it all in the Irish uh, flag colors instead. And people just went, ah, uh, this guy gets it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and without making a big song and a dance and, and riling up the crowd, he was, he was just brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, I would definitely go and see him again, but he could make political statements very cleverly about the country he was in. It's like, yeah. He came and he cared. He wasn't just showing up at the stadium and then singing. He was, what is it to be Irish? What does it mean to be living in Ireland? What's currently going on? What? How can I help them ease their pain? Um, very clever. It's interesting that you mentioned the lead singer of the Smiths throwing the flowers. Mm. Is If you think back within the last 70 years, what was probably the most rebellious uh, movement or the one that had the most impact on showing against the the establishment, the one that was the most effective or the, the first, which have been the hippie movement in the 1960s. Yeah. It was all about flower power. So the idea of flowers being anti-establishment is very mm -hmm. old. Yeah. Yeah. Even though, you know, so the whole idea of just, um, to give another antidote, um, this was back at the, I think it was the G7 or G8, I don't forget which number it was at that time in Canada. Mm. One of the main uh, acts of civil disobedience they did is they had a teddy pole, a teddy bear catapult, where they were just throwing teddy bears <laughs> from a catapult over the boundaries into the realm where all the ministers were. Huh. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, the, but often that's how revolutions, real revolutions start. It's not through complete combat. Yeah. It's through civil disobedience 
and uh, not it's civil disobedience, but it's not conflictual. Yes, not conflictual. Yeah, there is there's a plethora of videos appearing on social media of people self auditing government, especially in the UK, not so much in Ireland, but they're you know they're hanging outside police stations and video. And then invariably the police person comes out and starts saying, you know, stop videoing and mm-hmm. and it creates conflict. And um and I and I think this is partly a good thing and a bad thing in that it's showing that actually we still have a lot of civil rights, but we it could cause issues. <laughs> it's a double-edged sword. Um I remember also here in, in Ireland, we had people, you know, the whole BLM thing and people were sitting down in the streets in America and they were doing a little bit of that here. And I get, get the sit down protests. I mean, sit down protests, like, you know, student, I remember students doing it in my, my university when they were, they were campaigning about, they were getting rid of grants and they were going to introduce a loan system in, in the UK. And <laughs> I remember this girl, she stood up on the in the canteen and stood up on the canteen table. She gave this amazing rousing speech and like really firing everybody up. And we're going to go to the library and we're going to sit in the library all night. And, you know, we're going to sit down and make a protest. And there's a guy just all the way through the thing, just eating his egg and chips. And he goes, <laughs> well, just fucking sit down so I can finish my lunch, a bitch. <laughs> and it was just like... You know, he was like working class student and then this kind of like hyper, well-educated uh, activist. <laughs> and I just thought, yeah, that's the thing, you know. Uh, it's nice. You, 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 and I see that here in Ireland when we had, we had a lot of uh, smaller sort of protests. With, with, and the farmers, I think, here are the best for uh, protesting. They just get in their tractors and drive into Dublin and cross traffic chaos, even more traffic chaos than there is. Um, but at least they, they do something, you know, and it's not never violent. It's all in, in uh, good, uh, yeah. you know, with, with a, with a, with a means to it. Um, it is interesting. Also, we talk about the truckers in Canada and what they did. And I think that's, there was an immediate uh, crush on that, you know, to crush mm-hmm. it. And to think the power of the ordinary person, just, you know, just rolling up in the truck and. Well, there's an interesting uh, moment right now with the um, fuel prices in the UK. Hmm. I don't know if you've seen this, but there's an association where they're trying to get, say, if we get a million people to sign on, none of us will pay our energy bills in October. Yeah, I've seen this. Yeah. Yeah. And those those are the types of civil disobedience that actually are everyday people, you know, doing their civil disobedience. Mm. And if we look at history, I think India is probably the best example. That was how Gandhi forced independence on the UK. It wasn't through armed uprising. Mm. It was through people who were suffering, saying we're not going to we're going to limit our suffering. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that that's what promotes real change. Yeah, it, it it provokes me to think about what's going on in Europe at the moment, and how events like what's going on currently, and also what's happened previously, genuine or non-genuine, hu- human human created, non-human created, whatever, it can be leveraged for other gains, you know, a um, friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours, Alan is just back from two, two weeks in Portugal and, mm-hmm. you know, he, a cappuccino and a muffin for 270, two euro 70 to have that in Ireland is probably 10 euro, you know, what's going mm-hmm. on. And maybe 270 in, in Portugal is really expensive. I don't know. But um, it's, you know, uh, my electric bill in the clinic is double. It's literally double overnight. Yeah. Um, 
so what do we do? Do we just start mass non-payment? I don't know if Ireland would do that. You know, um, there's a, a level of social programming and conformity that's been going on for such a long time. Um, but I do think if humans could pull together, in a, as you say, in a peaceful, intelligent way, mm -hmm. there's a reckoning. There's a reckoning that can occur. There's an awakening, or I don't really like the word awakening, but you know what I mean. No, no, yeah. Um, I think. You know, I think everybody needs to reread David Thoreau's uh, Civil Disobedience. And to really understand what we're, what the idea is of civil disobedience. Mm. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's. Is it is yeah. it really disobedience or is it like for me, I, I sometimes see like this thing in the UK, I've seen it, I know what you're talking about. Is it more about just rejecting? not being disobedient just nah. well the term civil disobedience means being disobedient in a civil way it means looking at where injustice is and standing up to it but not mm. in the overt aggressive way mm. right and it's in yeah. some ways it's taking taking charge of your own life for yourself for who you are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is interesting because there's also a huge part of, at the same time, accept, seeing the way the world is and accepting it for what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a term that is often misunderstood because a lot of people think if you accept it, it means you agree with it. Mm -hmm. But accepting, in this case, what I'm referring to is seeing it exactly for what it is and knowing that that's where it is, mm -hmm. right? Mm. Then you can respond to it as opposed to react to it. Mm -hmm. And I guess it comes down to this, is that a lot of the civil disobedience we're talking about is more a response to the situation than a reaction. You know, we always talk about this idea is that there's reactionaries yeah, but what we yeah. should be looking for is responsor responsories. I don't know if that's a yeah. word. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> but well, I mean, we should be moving away from the idea of reaction. Reaction means we're not thinking about our actions. Mm. We're just an action happens to us, and we react to it. Whereas yeah. response has the word ponce in it. Mm -hmm. Ponce comes from the French penser, which means to think. So yeah. our action is left by our integrating the situation and then thinking, and then action is coming. And it's interesting because if we go back two or 300 years in history, in this current reality, is there was, it was more revolutionary. Yes. It was more of the fashion to be a revolutionary, which in a way create, garnered a lot more physical risk. Yeah. Um, and I feel like they've been closing in on the revolutionaries, you know, closing in on them, closing in on them. So we have to be, as you say, more responsive, more intelligent. Yeah, um, we have to, what I would say, and this is going to go into a different cop, uh, content, but we have to stop, res stop reacting from the place of our collective trauma, mm -hmm. work on our collective trauma and start responding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 that's that's maybe part of our process of being here at this in this current time frame you know it's interesting clients that i talk to and treat and as the last more so this year there's there's a very common thread it's like they'll say to me is it just me or is the world getting crazier <laughs> and crazier and more crazy things going on. And I'm like, well, I think it was always really crazy. It's just you're even more aware of actually how 
like, like again, you have to define what you mean by crazy, right? There's a definition around that. But um, I would almost say some things that are done are nonsensical or they don't make common sense. Um, but there is this thing of, of people saying to me, oh, like, what? I don't understand what's going on. You know, what is actually going on? Why is this happening? Why are we going through this? Um, yeah. I always think of us sometimes as a, a baby in a carton having a tantrum and we're trying to figure out as humans, like where we fit in, in this. Well, I think that we're also, we are at a, how would I say this? We're at a moment where there is a difference into the way that it was, we would respond before. Mm. And as much as, if we think about on an individual level, we are becoming much more aware of the effects of trauma, of early childhood experiences, adverse childhood experiences, all of those types of things. Um, and by doing that, we are also starting to recognize the same thing in our society. Right. So before we wouldn't be um, the idea of understanding what happened before and the traumas that our parents lived through in generations. We're only now starting to realize that that has an effect on us. So at the same time, there's this beginning of understanding and seeing trans generational trauma and personal trauma guiding how we re react to the world. Mm. So we have on one case, this awareness of our responsibility to get rid of this trauma or to work through this trauma. And on the other hand, we have um, a greater way of reproducing trauma through social media through being more connected and it's almost like these two things are coming together at the same time mm. in one way you know in psychology at least there's a huge there's been a huge shift within the last 20 years of looking at people's childhood experiences to describe and to understand how they're behaving as adults and at the same time, we've had a huge impulse or, you know, over the last 25 years of just trying to change them based on their chemical makeups of their mind with drugs. Mm, 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 mm. So we're having these two separate things and we can look at that also in society. You know, I think that's part of why like the Black, Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement is often about saying this is our past trauma. We need to start dealing with it. Mm. And then there's a lot of pushing back against that saying, no, we're just going to look at what's happening right now and deal with that. And there's mm. those two different uh, possibilities sort of colliding. And I think that's what gives a lot of people. Um, it's very uncomfortable for a lot of people because dealing with past trauma has many components to it, but two of the main ones are dealing with how I was traumatized and how I traumatized others. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it takes taking responsibility for our past actions. Yeah. And that, you know, nobody wants to take responsibility. That's mm -hmm. a general statement in life. Mm -hmm. There's a quite a lot of my clients have gone and done ayahuasca and, you know, these various interventions um, some of which have done it once or twice and got a lot from it and others it's almost like it's become the new addiction they have to go yeah. every couple of months to do it and um, it seems to me more and more as it's becoming I mean I thought maybe the popularity of ayahuasca would wane you know but it doesn't seem to be um, and no. of course on that side you have the genuine article and then you have the kind of the what I call the plastic ayahuasca, where it's just, you know, mm -hmm. a laptop and some guy cobbling it together in his kitchen and throwing it out there. And, and, um, it's, 
it, it's interesting that at all levels it's becoming successful for a reason. Um, and there's very few that I've met, people that have met, there's a few that have said, yeah, we've, we've been through it. It's eventually after 12 ceremonies that we realize you need to get someone who can do proper integration. Who can, that's, I think that's the key to it. Yeah. And that, it took them that long to realize that integration was actually more important than taking the plan in a way. Well, you know? How would I say this? Ayahuasca or any of these psychotropic drugs, psychedelics, you know, if, it's like opening a door to a different perception. Hmm. But just to see something doesn't help you integrate it. Mm -hmm. It's then working with those images, working with what came up, working with what that was showing you about yourself and doing all the work after. Mm -hmm. uh, and we go back to this idea of spiritual materialism, where a lot of people are just, I want to accumulate the experiences without doing the work. Mm -hmm. Right? So they're looking for transcendence. I'll keep doing it until I become perfect, as opposed to I might do it once, do it twice, and then work with what comes up. Mm -hmm. And that's the transformation. That's the alchemical process mm. of what's there. But it's a business at the same time. So the business is getting people to come in and do the do ceremony. The yeah. Yeah. The follow up business or the follow up part of that is not very, it doesn't have the same business model. If you can get 30 people to come and do a ceremony for two days, three days, four days, they pay, they leave. The follow-up are on individual sessions, maybe group sessions, all of this type of stuff. That doesn't, it's not as cost effective. And most people don't have the skills to do the integration or that are doing the ceremonies. Now that's starting to change. There is a whole psychological group. You know, it's starting to be used by psychologists. It's starting to be used by integrators um, who are trained in not only doing the ceremony, but also the follow-up to the ceremony and working with the person for the next six months. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the big, big problems with the psychedelic movement is, is that it's shown as that's, for me, that's the key part is the integration, not the ceremony itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and if people are interested in that, the best person probably at the moment who's speaking about it is somebody like Gabor Mate, who is really working on the ceremony itself is, is one thing, but it's the integration and the working with it afterward that's the most important yeah. aspect of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, say even in some ways, Qigong has that same aspect to it. And yoga should have that same aspect to it. If you're really going to work on it, you it's doing the work. So it's doing the practice. But it's also then experimenting, experiencing, and working with the emotions that come out of it. Sure, sure. You know, for example, today we were doing the internal work, and I was saying that, I was getting this feeling, an emotion of, as I was coming closer into my center, I was starting to have this idea of being selfish or that I shouldn't be taking all this energy for myself. So now my work is over the next couple of weeks is to go back to that and work on it and understand that emotion. Because that's what the Qigong was for. It was to bring me in contact with that energy of myself to understand it. Mm. Whereas a lot of people will just have do the Qigong. And, oh, that was interesting. And then move on. Well, it's it's super interesting you have that because there's something I didn't get a chance to. <laughs> You're going to love this. You're going to love this. Uh, during that practice that we did together we had to do some visualization, right? So we had to use our imagination 
And uh, part of that is to visualize ourselves in this. We're not going to give the game away, but we're visualizing ourselves in a particular situation, working with that. And I couldn't visualize myself. So I was visualizing you. <laughs> and so that, I didn't want to say that to you, but that, so I've saved it probably for the podcast is I couldn't see me, but I could see you. So that always tells me where, when I'm training or teaching, where that person is at. Mm -hmm. So what does it tell you about where I'm at that you see me and not yourself? Well, it just tells me that you were really focused on you. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's not that I couldn't think of myself. It's that your image was superimposed. So, okay. but I, I recognize because 20 odd years of doing it, it's like, okay, there's, there's a process occurring at both ends. So mm -hmm. it's like uh, the recognition of seeing that I know that you are doing that. And then the realization of, because I've done that exercise a thousand times, it's okay, Jonathan's there. But then I'm recognizing, well, well, you know, some part of me is integrating that as we're all one anyway. It doesn't really matter if I see Jonathan there or me there within that. It's, but it, it is, it, I, so what I'm saying is, what I've, what one of the key aspects I learned from from, from the Neigong teacher was it's information. It's just information. It doesn't mean it's real. It's just mm -hmm. if you see that happening, then it's only when you started to talk more about it. I was like, okay, I don't know if I should say this or not, <laughs> but now it kind of makes sense now to say it. That um, you know, and the, and the reason is in the past I've said things and then you know the person's gone. No, I don't know what you're talking about. So. But it kind of makes sense to, to me now why your image was superimposed on me. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do with strength or weakness or boundaries. or yeah. It's just information into what's going on in the, in the whole process between us, not just what I'm doing and what you're doing. There's... there's I'm sure. So, what I'm why I'm saying this is, I'm sure within the shamanic realms, I'm pretty certain, having spoken to different shamans, that there are times when, you know, shaman will take a little bit, the student will take a little bit of plant, and then there's a shared experience. Mm -hmm. you know, it happens with people when they've taken LSD. Um, a, a guy I went to university said there was five lads in the flat, and they all took the same dose. And they're all high pretty much at the same time. And uh, they were just went through a, a whole gambit of emotions. And then they got to this point towards the end of the journey where they all started having shared experiences. And uh, one guy was like a vegan. And uh, most of the lads in the house weren't vegan. And he stood up and said, I've got to free the milk. We have to free the milk. And he said, like, the other four lads stood up and went, yes, free the milk. And he said, they all kind of like in this high state, marched into the kitchen, opened the fridge and started pouring the milk down the sink. And they're having this shared trip, the shared experience, the shared emotion. And so when I start to see, so obviously when I was working with that, I was expecting to see myself, you know, in that position, holding that posture, breathing in a certain way and condensing the breath. And I was like, okay, there's a mini John Shubbs there. What's he doing there? <laughs> <laughs> huh, it's like, he's got one and I've got one. Where's mine? Where's the mini Anthony Monty? So then I go, okay, yeah. what are you going to do? Try to force it? Are you yeah. going to try to like replace that? Or are you just going to, okay, we're working with the mini John Shubbs. And so it's then afterwards, you, it still works. I mean, they still yeah. get the effect, but it's just, okay. okay. Is there's an information pattern there. So my, my question now is what do you how do you interpret that information or what do you make from it? I couldn't, I couldn't interpret it until afterwards. And then when you said and you were talking about the emotion, I I didn't, it's only now during this podcast for some reason it's come to me. Perhaps that's just information over about either where you were at, you know, like you're thinking very much about. I mean, I always look at the word self-ish. It's a little bit of the self. Yeah. We, we kind of we kind of equate selfish as a bad word. It's a nasty word. It's like, e -e 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 -e. but really it's just 
itself in a little ish of it. So we should just say sometimes it's okay to be, you know, oh, you're so self-centered, Jonathan. Jesus Christ, you're so, so selfish. You're always so selfish. And it's like, well, what else is there? <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's interesting. It's interesting when you just said self-centered, I guess the idea is to be centered without the self. <laughs> Well, I think to be centered without the self, you have to work on learning how to sense, be self-centered. <laughs> exactly. It's an interesting thing. It's first you have to be self-centered and then you can yeah, let go of the self. But you, so, can't be, you can't be centered without first being self-centered. It's a very yeah. interesting. Uh, but then it's so, also cultivating the self in a way that it will allow the self to fall away. Right. So that's that five stages we I was talking about. And I'm saying it's not the absolute way of doing it. It's right. a, a particular roadmap for the kind of practice. So we've we've worked for the last two years on structure, feeling fascia, feeling, you know, all of that, and then working with the mind and now working with the chi and perhaps self-centered without centered without centering without self is the that fifth would be one. the fifth one that neither of us have necessarily gotten to yet. No, and maybe artificially we may have been there, but um you know I think that's one of the yeah, that's one of the things that we often forget is people often have this idea is there's an ultimate goal of I want to be, you know, uh, I want to become fully awakened or a realized individual or this. But yeah. when, you, when you look at the literature and the people who might have gone through this process, it always seems as a never-ending process is that there isn't a moment where you can say, oh, I've succeeded. Right? Mm. There might be milestones that you accomplish throughout the system, but there's not a moment where it stops. Yeah, that's very particularly true of Neigong, I can say for sure. I think Qigong, it's a modernized word. You know, um, I, think, I think if you go looking for an end goal, you're going to be disappointed. You know, you're going to be... Like, I mean, we had this conversation a few weeks ago, I remember, I was, like, where would you like to be? And I, you know, I am fascinated with what super certain humans can do within that realm of internal work. And they are, do have exceptional feats, but would you want to live that life? And at nearly 50, uh, it's being, con you just are where you are and, and it's learning to be content and there's a part of me I can definitely say that still has discontent. Um, it's an interesting word, discontent. Disc I'm discontent, discontent. So it's like without content. So I'm going to spend the next X amount of time here working on what, it, you know, working on finding, well, not even finding, but just what what's the... It's like when you said to me, what have you been doing for the last three months or four months? You know, because we hadn't had much chance to chat. Yeah. I've just been training with a goal. No, just train, just training. Yeah. Um, um, and, and that for me is very different to my previous life, which was, you know, working towards the black belt, getting the first dance, second dance, senior dance, whatever it was. Yeah. And we liked that. We, we, I mean, I posted well, a, a thing there that, about that feeds our egoistic approach of saying of accumulation, yeah. right? That's that's accumulation. Yes, yes. it goes and back to the beginning of this cat podcast. It's it, exactly. is that a spiritual accumulation? Is it a materialistic? Is it well, accumulation is always materialistic in some sort, hmm. right? That is the that is what. That's one of those links that as soon as you're trying to accumulate something, you're trying to create, you're trying to hold on to matter. Whereas it could be spiritual materialism, it could be accomplishment materialism, it could be physical materialism, monetary materialism. All of those things are about accumulating something. Yeah. Yeah. And as we were saying, as you were saying, is, is that this was the first time you were training for the fact of training itself, not to get somewhere. Yeah, uh, well, it was the first time in a while. I wouldn't say it was the first time ever, but it was the first time in a while. It was just you know training. Like I do remember, 
in the beginning of like doing that sort of stuff, it was like, I wanted to get to that point. I remember in the beginning, I wanted to stand, be able to stand for an hour and a half. Like I'm gonna, and you know, the clock and each month would go by and then I'd be at 45 minutes. And I used to like get to like 45 and 50 minutes of standing and John John and thinking, I can't go any further. I can't go any further. And um, then the mind started, it started to become about the mind, you know? Um, and then I spoke to a friend of mine who practices Yi Chuan or Yi Li Chuan. It's like a type of uh, boxing and they do a lot of standing and they sometimes do three hours a day. And I said, like, what's the point in standing so long? Like it's, there's a law of diminishing returns, you know, because he said, actually, you, you're right. He said, um, they stand for three hours a day in China for this martial art. He said, but to be honest with you, the first hour is physical and the last two hours is just for the mind, you know? Um, and so I, I learned as the years went by quality, you know, 20 minutes of high quality consistently has far greater returns for me personally in this current working environment, home environment, as a therapist environment than trying to go for like as much as possible. Um, yeah. Cause I've done it. I've tried it and yeah, it's super interesting. And yeah, you do get very interesting, shall I say downloads or pieces of information or insights, or you could liken it to shamanic work or mm -hmm. whatever it is. It is fascinating, but the beauty of like what we're doing is that, um, it's like riding a bicycle. Once you get into that rhythm of doing it, you, you never have to go back. You know, there's never this thing of having to restart, which I felt in the martial arts, like I've been years out of it now. Going back to do it's like, oh, you know, it's there, there's sparks, but you have to relearn, um, which I never felt that with Qigong Neigong. I felt that once it's there, the flow and the movement and the breath just stays with you. It's integrated. Um um, but we we are definitely goal orientated. You know, there, there was a situation I remember in the UK where there's these Korean masters stepping off the planes, you know, and they were second dan in Korea and fifth dan in, in the UK. And they pretty much got three dans just on that 14 hour flight. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this idea of, uh, black, you know, the black belt was in the suitcase, you know. Um, uh, and we do, we do, go down that route. I mean, I advertised recently for a course that I'm going to be teaching next year in Twina and I get a lot of inquiries that, and the first thing is like, they don't go, Oh yeah. And they want to know straight away. When's the intermediate, when's the advanced? I'm like, hold on a minute. We've not even begun training and you're already, you know, qualified. So I tend to, I tend to just not engage in that and say, look, let's, let's see how you are first with your foundational work, you know, um, and it's a little frustrating for them because they like structure. Well, uh, I think that's also a lot of people come in specifically. Um, I want to get rid of my pain. That's the main reason that people come for treatment. Mm. So as a practitioner, it's very difficult to balance that idea of, okay, they have a chief complaint. They have a reason for being there that we want to work with. Mm. And at the same time, one of our main, my main goal is it's not that I want you, this is again a Michael Brown statement, but I think it's very appropriate, is it's not that I want you to feel good, I want you to get good at feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because as we get good at feeling, then we can understand And if there's something there for us to learn about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is one of the, I think, the main problems in treatments is that a lot of people are too concerned about uh, getting a result and not concerned enough about doing the process. Yeah. And also accepting that the process for some people is longer or shorter. And it's longer and there's 
you know, it comes back to doing the work. Yeah. You know, as, as you work more in therapeutic work, I'm sure you've seen the same thing, or I imagine you have, is that you become less interested in, you, you realize that the, the symptom that the person comes in for is not the real work that needs to be done. That's just the entry point into the person. That's mm. the entry point of where you're starting from. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I had this discussion the other day with a student, which was uh, you're going to get clients coming to the clinic who will say, oh, you know, general stress, generally tired, a little bit burnt out, whatever. And then invariably they'll even write that down on their intake form or whatever. And then 20 minutes in, it's like, well, actually I'm here for fertility. Oh, okay. You know, and that may be more to do with the social elements of that and Mm -hmm. to remain confidential and secret about it. And that's fine. That's all good. Uh, And then there'll be some people you come, like I've had some very interesting, very, unusual cases recently more so than ever and uh yeah it's as a therapist you do realize oh i get especially when you're doing like work on yourself you start to go okay this person's come in with say a stroke recovery and you go back through the journey of how the stroke started and what the way they were at and what they were doing and you're like okay wow you know wow there's a lot a lot going on it's not just wanting to come out of a stroke it's there's a whole life story there yeah uh, and there's an underlying emotions that you can see are not being handled um and i say to the students so you, you've got to look at you know you could be a pain specialist you could be a fertility specialist you could be a, a, a ms me recovery specialist uh, fibromyalgia whatever but you still got to look at you will start to notice the root cause isn't just dysfunction of certain organs. There can be, it's a, there's a much, uh, I'd say even beyond the root cause. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's- I would. And I would say is that, you know, from a TCM perspective or a Chinese medicine perspective, we look at the zong fu, so the organ, and right? we're trying to hmm. work with the organs. Again, that's just a context and a framework in which to navigate and to understand the person behind it. Mm. Mm. Um, it's not the... It's a contextual or it's a it's a framework in which you can enter into the person, but you're not really treating the organ itself. You're treating the human being, the person there who has that organ. Yeah. Yeah. And it becomes easier in treatment at the beginning, at least, to focus on the organ because that's something that you can work with. Mm. So you've been able to develop that understanding of this organ is just a representation or an archetype in which this is where the person is stuck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. In the UAT system, we always start with the fundamentals of understanding the interactions of the channels, and we start with treating pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the same time, that's an introduction into, because we're treating pain through interactions in the system, as opposed to just focusing on where the pain is, it's creating something a bit different. Mm-hmm. And it's that it's bringing, the, it's bringing the practitioner into an understanding of how to treat the holistic aspect as opposed to just treating the symptom, which mm-hmm. would be much more, you know, local treatments, things like that, or just treating the symptom. Mm-hmm. As soon as you start bringing in systems, you start br- bringing in the whole person. Then you start to develop a knowledge or an understanding of what's going on below it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, having worked with uh, other systems and trying to then figure out you know, some of the knowledge base around that. And, uh, you know, the question arose for me is where does this ease start? Like being 
not at ease. And you're correct. It is. It is, as you say, zang fu five element da 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 da. Whatever it is, pulse diagnosis. It's always. It's giving a structural con content or context to to as you say to gain entry. Um, yeah. There is a teacher of mine in Turkey who who's who he uh, he does the kind of a cranial osteopathy system, but it's actually more than that, and it's completely just spiritual. It's all treating the spirit and spiritual aspects and and miscommunications between various spiritual aspects of ourselves. And I'm saying I'm using the word spiritual and in a, in a non-religious sense. Um, uh, yeah, and it, yeah, it's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me now that, you know, we talked about deeper self, higher self today. Um, and it, it remem- I remember asking uh, Master Leo, it's like, where does, where does the illness start with, with one of the systems he was teaching? And he's like, it starts from up here. <laughs> you know, that, that, you know, why does that person have ME or does it have MS? And so it's, it's always from up here down, you know. Um, and then it's like, as, as a young man trying to go, huh? You know, what's he talking about? How can it be up there? You know, uh, and then now, you know, you sort of go, okay, maybe, maybe a lot of the stuff that we, you could argue is that rooted in uh, pre, is he talking pre heaven? You know, is he talking uh, uh, even more deeper than that in terms of uh, there's a dysfunction with, with our original source energy. And uh, is there a dysfunction with our higher self and the diseases manifesting within us in the physical realm, you know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I always think of, our kids, you know, when our kids are playing their PlayStations and mm-hmm. have a connector and we are the character in the simulation and our real self is the person driving it. And perhaps <laughs> the person and that driving is a bit stoned and been drinking beer and I'm all over the place today. <laughs> My higher self is, is not concentrating. But you that know. reminds me of a story. This was often um, told by Carl Jung, C.J. Jung, it was called the medicine man and it was his idea of the ultimate therapy. So this is a story that is often told in Chinese, uh, it's a Chinese parable. There was a village that had a huge drought for many months. It had no rain and the villagers kept asking, you know, they did everything. And then finally they asked this one man, this medicine man to come and help them. So he walks into the village and he looks in the village and he says, okay, I'll be in here. And he goes into a hut. He just sits there for about three weeks. He doesn't eat. He doesn't sleep. He just sits in the hut. And then he comes out of the hut and starts to rain. Mm-hmm. And the village asked him, what did you do? And he says, well, when I came into the village, I saw that everything was in disarray. Nothing was right in the village. So I sat in the hut. And I put myself in order. I went through everything that was in myself that was out of order. And once I was in order, the village became in order and started to rain. And that's the goal, according to Jung, of therapy, is to put the self in such order that the universe around you starts to flow properly. Um, And that is... often kept that as that is one of the goals of our us as therapies is to help people on that journey to put themselves into order. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I like that idea. Knowing that we can't put them in order, but we can be a, we can be the hut that contains them. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. We can be the place where they can feel safe to start to put themselves in order. Mm. Mm. And as practitioners, it also is imperative that we do the same work on ourselves. Yeah. That's why I really like where I'm at at the moment personally with my, with my own training is because that, that element has always been there from a very beginning in terms of when I'm learning, when I was learning first to, to work with energy and um, uh, 
my first teacher would say to me, like, who do you think is doing the work here? Who's really doing the work, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's that's stayed with me for many years. Who's really doing the healing here? Do you think it's you? Do you really think it's you? You know, and, used to, and it used to always come up when I was doing, I used to do a lot more cranial work and energy healing work and used to come up and literally like slap you or hit you on the back of the head and go, and he'd say, get out of your mind. You're in the mind. Yeah. You're trying to heal with your mind. And it's like, detach from the outcome. The most powerful healings you get is when you're not there. And he used to say to me, like when I was doing the work is imagine you're holding the person and you're working with them and then get on your motorbike in your mind and go for a drive down the country lane and enjoy that, what that's like, or get on a boat and sail the boat, detach. And it was true whenever I did energy work and I'd be present, but not focused in on like, I must move this bone or, I must exactly. you here. And yeah. yet then there is now you're seeing, and I am seeing, and maybe you're seeing it too, is there's these crowds emerging out of the Nagel and Qigong world where they're like, you must compress the chi into the Dantian and you must like rotate it and fire it out. And, and, it's, and many years ago, I thought that's where I needed to be. I needed to be the Jedi, you know. <laughs> um, but you try doing that when you're in a field with 40 people that need to heal fucking ain't gonna happen dude you know no matter how good your chi is you're not gonna go around every single person and inject them with chi and plus then you're defeating the whole yeah it's great intervention and you're you're not helping the person on their process exactly but it's good for them to experience what is possible as a human being if that's part of the process for that human being but isn't it far better like wang cheng jang said to me 1500 people a day at the lake Standing there, doing the China universe, opening and closing the lotus flower. He said, yeah, I'm doing nothing. They're all bouncing off one another, creating a field of energy. Yeah. Well, this comes back to one of the main points that I, especially when I talk about the four needle five element technique and we're doing the abdominal palpation. One of the statements I often talk about is, one of my goals is to take the practitioner out of the treatment. Mm-hmm. Is to allow the system itself to heal the patient mm-hmm. and to step away from the idea of you need to diagnose, you need to understand, and mm-hmm. you need to know exactly what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, the human body is the most complex entity that we, we can find in the world, mm-hmm. in the material world. Mm-hmm. It would be extremely presumptuous of us to know that we can understand it yeah what we can do is we can follow the guidelines of the patient's body and if we if we're able to listen to what it's telling us just follow what it wants without us imposing this this or this sure Sure. um and that's a very similar idea is, is that we need to be able to remove ourselves from the treatment we want to, the practitioner to almost just be a facilitator for the patient healing himself. The practitioner never heals the patient. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. On that note, coming back, the Dicky Bird tells me there's another book coming out very shortly. There is. It will come out on the 21st um that's That's the wedding anniversary so i can celebrate i said to my wife there's your wedding anniversary present (laughs) (laughs) probably just go joking um yeah brilliant so this is really the progression of where we were from sun season the channel so Mm -hmm. this is your model Exactly. So the Sun Seasons of Channels was the introduction to my my vision of Chinese medicine in the mm-hmm. basic form. So we looked at yin yang theory, five elements theory, and then mainly the channels. Why uh, why they were where they were on the body and how we can understand that. This book um, has the same characters. So Sun is returning to see the grandparents uh, for the second summer. And it's told in the same context of the tea sarah, you know, doing the afternoon tea. And in this book, the grandparents are teaching son 
about how and why the channels interact. So it goes through the, the ideas of imaging mirroring or holography in Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. right? So this is taking into account the idea of as above, so below, sure, and then sure. how we can find within one part of the body, the whole body. Um, and then it goes into understanding the channel interaction. So why, if I use one channel, will this have an effect on another channel? We go through the six systems to do that. And to understand that, we create what's called the unified acupuncture theory model, which sort of is the basis for us to navigate those interactions. Sure. Um, and then it's definitely, it's definitely having an impact because, as you know, a couple of days ago, this chap flew all the way to America from America mm -hmm. and looking for you. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> whatever situation, it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And I remember after having the interaction with Dallas, Dallas, if you're watching or listening, he's in Kilkenny, it's only half an hour away from here, so we might get a chance to catch him today. But he He's so impressed with, because he's an engineer, right? Mm. And then went into acupuncture. He, it's having an impact, you know, sometimes you don't realize, you know, for someone to want to come and, and learn directly. And I'm sure he will, he will, we will meet him. And I said to him, I have a really strong feeling this is not over. And I think I told him straight away, get this book. The next one is coming. Uh, yeah. And I feel there's two edges to this book, which is it could blow the doors open, and but it's going to invite also curiosity. Do you know? It's going to invite that curiosity to want to find out how how can I implement it? Yeah, yeah, no, no. So I think the book will be very good. Um, it's within the this idea of channel interactions and holography. There are a couple of other books out there, but in my opinion, they're not as clear or well-constructed. Well, of course, I'm going to say that. It's my book. Yeah. Um, but it's also one of the things that I really attach to with these books is that it's told as a story. It's not, you know, it's not this top down, do this, do that, do this. Yeah. It's told in a conversation. So it becomes more accessible and it becomes more, uh, it's something that you can actually interact with. Um, yes. Which, it's an you know, adventure. It's an adventure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which I think is an important aspect in learning is, is that you get into the uh, interaction with it and you become part of it. It's not a, um, yeah, it's not like this didactic do no. this, do that. It's conversational. It becomes. It feels to me like as if the story is almost how a family would have sparked that curiosity in their child. Exactly. Several years later, the child says, you know, maybe I could come and be your apprentice and work with you, whether it's an uncle, a mother, an auntie. Yeah. And it's the way it would be passed down from generation yeah. to generation. It's the yeah. traditional way of learning about the yeah. world. And it's interesting, one of the uh, Nagong guys that I follow, chap, uh, Master Yap, he, he talks about, you know, never really wanting to do what his dad and his uncle were teaching. It's like, yeah, kind of doing it because it's kind of expected of you. And he said it's then when he got to 18, he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I really, really, I'm here. I really want to do this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but having, because he was taught, it's like, it, so instead of him being in a temple and hidden away from society and doing it in that sort of Shaolin manner, it was done through family interaction, questioning answers, work with that, look at this, go away, think about that, form your opinions. And also it forces him to be in both worlds at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, the person yeah, who, yeah. who does this in the monastery and is shut off from the world can get very good at understanding the system implementing on themselves yeah you know but we still live in a world where people go out into the they have jobs they have families and as a practitioner if we don't take that into account 
and then you try to meet the person in the world that they're in, it can be very complicated. Sure, sure. So to bring this podcast to a conclusion, for those of you who've reached the end of this <laughs> uh, and have managed to get through it, Jonathan will be back in the new year. Dates to be finalized. Hopefully by tonight, Jonathan, actually, I just need to okay. sit down with Do research, my, yeah. with my uh, diary and have a look. Because mm -hmm. obviously Ireland is a small country and very much influenced by weekends and holidays and stuff. So um, I'd be really interested to see how things unfold in October following this book. I definitely will be pushing and promoting it here in Ireland just because I think it's necessary. Yeah. It may be the step that people need to think outside of the realms of where they've been. Um, the other thing is, is that you, you have both books that they can get off the website. Is that correct? Uh, I don't have the other book yet. I know she's going to send them to me, but yeah. we, we'll, um, We'll organize that anyway to, for the other UAT. There's like close to 30 UAT students in Ireland, so we'll see. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. they're going to be the first people that, that, that are, we'll reach out to once, once we're ready to go. Um, but I would like to then obviously keep people abreast of what's going on next year. Um, mm -hmm. I know you're going to be teaching again in, 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 um, in Chiwe. Um, yes. Chiwe, there's also going to be a course in uh, Berlin and Berlin. Poland. Yes. Are you going and back to Poland or? We're, yeah, probably. I'm still waiting on the dates again for Poland. That's still something that's going to come yeah. up. So if anyone's listening to this, you know, in the inter internet, web, YouTube, whatever it is, it's on whatever platform I've put it out there on, you don't need to wait to come to Ireland. He's there in Europe. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I do feel a very strong sense after today's training that uh, the next book has to be something completely out there. <laughs> I mean, like, really You're out You're not the there. first one to tell me that, that there's going to be a yeah. big change in what's it's, coming out. It's yeah. coming. I can feel it. Like even today, even the interaction, even the way that you're sat, you know, it's like you're in the, in that, you're in the Zen moment. So let's see, let's, let's see what gets created in, in the new year. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for making it this far through the podcast. I didn't do an intro because we were in the middle of vibing and I just said, right, we've got to record this because it, it's like slippery fish. They go through the net if you don't catch it. So we needed to catch that moment. Thanks for being with us. Thanks to Jonathan. He is probably the most, uh, uh, common guest or the most uh, <laughs> guest on my very small but humble podcast but uh, it's good to do these because if I don't I won't get done and we won't we're now into episode 20 something wherever we're at um, stay, stay tuned let's see what happens and uh, I will drop any details relevant below to Jonathan's work uh, links to anything coming up as we go on thanks for listening thanks for joining thank you See you soon.